Okay. Hello, welcome to a new series of Socialist Action webcasts in the fall of 2022. My name is Elizabeth Bice and I'm the Federal, Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee, a past Secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, and a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Wendat and Audenoshani people in a place called Toronto. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's topic is capitalism and the environment on the eve of COP27. Our speakers are Jeff Sparrow in Australia, Yvonne Anson in British Columbia, and Victor Morgan in Newfoundland and Labrador. Climate catastrophe is not a theory. It is here and now. How did this happen? And what should be done about it? Maybe we'll find some answers tonight. So let's hear from our first speaker. Jeff Sparrow is a lecturer at the Center for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne. He is a writer, editor, broadcaster, and Walkley award-winning journalist. He is a columnist for Guardian Australia, a former breakfaster at a radio station 3RR, and a past editor of Overland Literary Journal. He is the author of Crimes Against Nature, Capitalism and Global Heating, Fascism Among Us, Online 8 and the Christchurch Massacre, Trigger Warnings, Political Correctness, and the Rise of the Right, among other titles. So please, let us welcome Jeff. Thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, thanks, Socialist Action, to inviting me, for inviting me to this uh, web forum on such an important issue. So as Elizabeth said, I'm speaking to you from Australia, and I'm sure you will not be surprised to learn that Australia, like everywhere else, is facing an ecological catastrophe, manifesting in many ways, but particularly through an extinction crisis. Australia has the unhappy distinction of being one of the extinction capitals of the world, with mammals in particular in extreme peril. And the causes of that are manifold. Um, land clearing is one of them. But... They're also, it's also the result of climate change, both directly and indirectly. So directly, the changing climate is leading to habitat destruction. It seems now most likely that we're going to lose the entirety of the, the Great Barrier Reef. But indirectly, climate change is leading to phenomena like the terrible bushfires of 2019, 2020, which were estimated to have killed some 3 billion animals. An extraordinary um, toll on the Australian wildlife. In that context, Australia recently elected a new government with the fossil fuel friendly administration of Scott Morrison, who infamously once brought a lump of coal to the Australian Parliament and waved it around telling everyone not to be afraid of it, has now been replaced by the Labor government of Anthony Albanese, which came to the election on ostensibly a more climate friendly platform. However, the new government has just unveiled, courtesy of charismatic environment minister Tanya Plibersek, its response to the biodiversity in crisis in Australia, which took the form of, and this is a literal quote, proposing a Wall Street for nature in Australia. That is the, 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 the proposal, which is still being sketched out, would entail uh, further commodification of the Australian environment, allowing big corporations to invest in biodiversity credits of some kind or another, a scheme sort of very similar to the emissions trading scheme, which have been the, the, the hallmark of international climate um, action since the early 1990s. And I raise this for, um, for, for, for a few reasons. One is simply to make the point we are told over and over again by governments and by corporations that they want to do something to uh, prevent 
the environmental environmental catastrophe, but they are con constrained by the population. So corporations will tell us, look, we don't want to pollute, but you people demand, you know, you demand your cars and you demand your plastics and you demand all of these things because you are lazy and stupid and greedy. We therefore have no choice but to... Um, to meet your demands. In my book, Crimes Against Nature, one of the things that I, one of the arguments that I try to make is this is in fact historically wrong. But overwhelmingly, the, um, the most destructive environmental practices have been imposed by the corporations against the will of the population. And this is tremendously important, whether you're looking at, that, say, the history of car culture in the United States, where initially the population were tremendously resistant to the um, to, uh, to to cars and to, to fossil and to internal combustion engines more generally, or whether you're look, looking at the introduction of uh, disposable packaging and pl pl um, plastics again and again, we see that these um, these innovations are met with popular resistance, which then has to be overcome by the corporations in order for them to pollute to the extent that they want. And that's uh, the, the case with governments as well. In the, if, you if you look at Australia, Australia and Plutisec's proposal to introduce a Wall Street for nature, no normal person anywhere in the world looked at the destruction of the natural um, of the, of the natural environment and said, I know someone who will fix this for us, it's Wall Street. Nobody ever said that. The only reason this has been proposed is that these kind of market policies are business friendly. And Naomi Klein, amongst others, has done a really good job of documenting how when scientists began to warn of the environmental crisis, that this coincided with the era of high neoliberalism. So all of the strategies that were put forward focused on increased marketization with disastrous results for the environment. Essentially, all of these attempts to use the market to respond to uh, climate change involve incredibly complicated Byzantine processes where um, artificial commodities are created to in, to in an attempt to get the market to produce the kind of environmental outcomes that 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 um, environmentalists um, want. And, and again and again, this has proved disastrous that um, these systems are incredibly complicated. They are rife with fraud. When we talk about emissions trading systems again and again, what we see is that the, the so-called commodities that are being uh, traded bear no relationship to um, environmental outcomes of any kind, but in fact, uh, just provide an opportunity for corporations to enrich themselves. And I think it's important to recognize that this is not an accident. It's not just a matter of bad design. It, in fact, stems from a fundamental incompatibility between the way that an, a natural ecosystem works and the way that a market works. If you think about ecology, local eco ecologies are local, ecologies are concrete, ecologies are um, are self-contained. If we think about markets, markets are abstract, markets are international, markets are designed to expand blindly year after year. So there's a fundamental incompatibility between the two. And the capitalist response to the climate crisis has been to say that in fact, the market is more natural than nature itself. And if markets and nature clash, we need to adjust nature to make it more compatible with markets rather than the other way around. But I think we also need to go beyond the rhetoric that simply blames this on neoliberalism. Because of course, when we are talking about commodification, it's important to recognize that commodification is fundamental, not just to neoliberalism, but to capitalism as a whole. One way to describe capitalism is of course, generalized commodity. Um, generalized commodity production and the core commodity of capitalism is labor power and this is really fundamental to understanding the climate crisis i think because human beings have changed the natural world since time immemorial we have to do that it's part of um, our nature if, if you will in order to to clothe ourselves in order to feed ourselves we interact with the natural world and the name for that interaction is labor it's through labor that we change the world. It's through labor that we clothe ourselves and that we create homes and everything else. But 
the fundamental point is that the human interaction with the environment does not have to be destructive. There's no, it's, there's no necessity for labor to be a process that destroys the natural world. In fact, there are all sorts of human societies that we can look at. And I'm from Australia where we have um, a history of indigenous people living on the, on the continent where I am for some 40 to 50,000 years in an environment with the natural world which did not destroy nature, but in fact led to a more diverse ecology that led to flourishing ecosystems. And when you think about it, this shouldn't be surprising. It shouldn't be strange to think that humans can use their labor to improve the natural world, to, um, to work in ways that are compatible with the natural order around them. What should be strange is the commodification of, of our labor power, uh, the process that turns um, our ability to labor into a commodity that is bought and sold. And then when it is sold by a capitalist, the capitalist puts us to work in ways that we cannot control. And that's fundamental to the wages system. We work for an employer, the employer directs us, and they direct us. They direct us according to the logic of a capitalist system that is driven by blind, unplanned economic growth. And I think this is the fundamental root cause of the environmental crisis. I mean, think of that Disney um, cartoon, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where um, the, 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 the broom becomes animated and in fact, now that I think about it, I can't remember exactly what happens in that cartoon. But anyway, the, the, the human powers get out of control and become a force of destruction. And this is what the commodification of our labor power does. It turns our relationship with the natural world into something outside of our control, driven by forces that we um, as workers are no longer in control of with catastrophic results. So when we talk about the new COP meeting coming up, I think it's really important to recognize that underlying the, this crisis and its immediate symptoms is something more fundamental to do with the human relationship with labor, the human relationship with the natural world. And as part of understanding the human relationship with the natural world, we have to understand the way that human beings relate to each other and the fundamental exploitation, which is at the basis of capitalism, which is not to say that there is nothing that we can do about the environment short of abolishing capitalism. Of course, we should support any kind of uh, measures that make a difference in the here and the now any kind of measures that increase the confidence ordinary people have in their ability to change the world. But at the same time, I think we need to recognize that um, there is a reason why we are locked into this destructive cycle of environmental destruction. And that reason goes to the very heart of the capitalist order. And if we are going to get humanity out of the death spiral that it's currently in, we fundamentally have to challenge the logic of capitalism. And I see that I'm starting to run out of time. So perhaps I will leave things there. and look forward to hearing the other speakers. Oh, sorry. All right. So I didn't realize you were finished, comrade. I'm very sorry about that. All right. Our next speaker is Yvonne Anson, and she's a longtime activist and environmentalist with experience in both electoral and grassroots organizations. She lives in Vancouver, BC, where she has experienced the many shortcomings of capitalism firsthand, particularly the totally out of control housing crisis. Yvonne has worked with socialist organizations across the city and is currently playing a key role in the 2022 electoral campaign of Vote Socialist Vancouver. Yvonne is also a leading member of Socialist Action in British Columbia. Yvonne? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on today. Um, I thought it was interesting that Jeff mentioned, or in his bio, I guess it was mentioned, that um, you look at the kind of correlation between the rise of the far right and capitalism, because that's part of what I'm going to be chatting about today um, with a climate change lens, obviously. So uh, unfortunately, the science of climate change has been known since the late 19th century, when it was first argued that anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases could change the composition of Earth's atmosphere 
such that it better pertains heat, and that thus produces a warming effect across the face of the planet. The science at the time was largely dismissed as a problem of the far future. In the 1950s, scientists discovered that the surface layers of the Earth's oceans had a limited capacity to absorb carbon dioxide, which would therefore mean that continuation of emissions would pose a problem, given that they had nowhere to go but to accumulate in the atmosphere. And this was, at that time, still considered a problem of the far future. And when the first COP summit was held in Berlin in 1995, countries from around the world got together to negotiate terms, goals, and practices to combat the looming threat of climate change, which was still considered a problem of the future uh, at that time. <laughs> but the threat was then understood to be somewhat more imminent. imminent. Quite how imminent it was, however, uh, was not, and is still not, well understood. We have models that can predict the effects that climate change will have on the environmental composition of the globe, but we don't have models that tell us accurately how society will react to this changing composition. And I suspect that this reaction has the potential to dem devastate human life far before the floods and fires of the not so distant future will ever get the opportunity. So in 2019, while some areas of the Arctic and Antarctic hit four degrees of uh, warming, the world finally appeared ready to take action. And millions strong marches took to the streets led by those who would be most affected by the climate disaster, being children and teenagers. And it seemed like the climate movement finally had ample wind in its sails. And that feeling quickly evaporated in 2020 with the onset of the global pandemic. So burdened by this unexpected comorbidity, we allowed the fanfare of climate action to really take a backseat in our minds as we were understandably <laughs> preoccupied with the more imminent of two simultaneous existential crises. And out of mind, but not out of sight, uh, in the past two years, unusual weather events driven by climate change have ravaged our towns and our cities and added a chill air of unease, uncertainty, and irregularity to an already tense collective mental state wrought by the mass death, hysteria, and social isolation of the pandemic. So the impact that this level of repeated stress and trauma and unpredictability has had on the fabric of our society cannot be understated. Beneath all of this, the warming of the planet and the mass death of the pandemic, a reciprocal crisis has arisen, and it's spurred on by the societal unease produced by climate change, but more so spurred on by its root cause, which we as socialists know to be capitalism. To say capitalism has caused illness of our planet and of society is nothing particularly groundbreaking, but to summarize, capitalism is a system which relies on infinite growth within a finite system. And at the tail end of what is possible in terms of growth, capitalists become desperate and they grasp at ever more exploitative and destructive means of arresting from the earth and from their workers every last hour and penny of capital. And we are now at that tail end and having ravaged the earth and each other so thoroughly in the pursuit of profit that every aspect of our natural and social environment is contaminated and collapsing. What a joy. Uh, this has been both the genesis and the impetus of climate change, as well as the primary obstacle to disaster prevention, and at this point, mitigation. But the reciprocal crisis that I have referred to is a product of the mental stress caused by climate change and the many other manifestations of the illness of capitalism. Hypercapitalism in a finite system inevitably collapses. And at this point, watching the dominoes fall to their terminus, it is evident that this collapse will precipitate an ever more oppressive and dominant global political system. And that is fascism. So fascism is the politics of fear and it arises in times of great social unrest and economic uncertainty. It is born of unrest and perpetuated by fear. And those who seek greater levels of social control have an interest in engineering these prerequisites. We saw something like this in the early 2000s when the US fictionalized enemies overseas to justify endless wars that propelled the capitalist machinery of the military industrial complex. 
And we saw this famously in World War II. I'm sure I need not remind any of you of the devastation left in the wake of the Treaty of Versailles that was then weaponized by opportunistic politicians. And we see it today when Tucker Carlson and his cronies weave white supremacist conspiracy theories into the minds of their confused and exhausted working class watchers, uh, Americans, um, and they weaponize the disorientation wrought by the past decade of news events against a fictionalized Judeo-communist government of pedophilic elites whose carefully calculated machinations perfectly cover up the hasty and chaotic and pathologically narcissistic reality that is capitalist control. So when I look into my little crystal ball, <laughs> I see a world that has collapsed into fascistic rule akin to the Roman Empire, where fear drives all decision making. And it's fear of the climate refugees who pour into Canada from the increasingly unlivable global south. And it's fear of the co-hegemonic superpowers who rise to dominate the new Mediterranean that is the Atlantic or the Arctic Circle. And eventually, fear of each other as scrutiny and surveillance by our corporate overlords works its way not just between social groups but between individuals. So just as the employer's surveillance state today in the factory stands between workers who would otherwise whisper to each other of pay discrepancies and union cards, the fascist states of the not-so-distant future will stand between comrades like you and I and all of us who seek to organize on these platforms, which even now are owned by our oppressors. So what can we do? <laughs> what can we do? It, it is cliche to say, but the enemy of fear is hope. And the catalyst of hope is action. So only in knowing that we are actually doing all that we can to mitigate disaster will we find hope. And socialism, fortunately, is the politics of hope. It's the politics of trust and of mutual understanding. The world will change. It will as the climate warms, and that is now inevitable. But banded together, we can navigate these changes and rise to meet them with appropriate measure. We as socialists recognize that mitigating disaster requires immediate action. We will have to give up our current way of life, and that is okay. Our world was built under the assumption that en uh, energy is infinite, and it's not. <laughs> we will have to rebuild it. We will develop a society that accepts that supermarkets may not carry pears in the spring and strawberries in the winter, and that enables us to walk from place to place without crossing miles of concrete infrastructure, and that admits that some industries must be left in the past and allowed to die out without being propped up by easily swayed governments, and that supports the workers who rely on these industries and ensures that their livelihoods do not die out consequentially. We must end bailouts and tax breaks for toxic industries. We must ensure that public money funds public goods. But another important element of this action that is often omitted, omitted by non-socialist environmentalists is that we must work to rebuild and reinforce the fragmented social bonds within our culture. The weapon of fascism is fear. It is fear of the other, fear of the unknown. And we must come together as the working class and demonstrate the idea that we are stronger in numbers, whoever those numbers might include. We must enable workers to fight alongside each other for rights and wages. We must ensure that the most privileged, that as the most privileged among us rise, everyone else in society rises with them. We must install a leadership that is held accountable to the people to ensure that our collective needs are being fought for, but also to mend the legacy of betrayal and distrust between governments and their people. And we must consider people as people, not as units of productivity or as nodes on an assembly line. Finally, finally, we must conquer our would-be corporate emperors. We must strip them of their power. We have to nationalize the industries that supply us with the necessities of life. So food, water, power, mobility, housing, healthcare, communication. These are the goods that provide for the people. They must be owned by the people. Come on. Like, and, and this cannot happen within a capitalist system. There's no capitalist road to socialism. A system based on exploitation cannot beget equality. And that is why socialists call for revolution. We see that the collapse of capitalism is imminent. We see the signs and we know where the dominoes are falling. We know how rapidly our political systems are degenerating into fascism, how our democratic institutions are silently being replaced by fascist facades. We know that this transition will happen and it is happening and how fear is being weaponized and how the uncertainty reality of climate change is inflicting collective trauma on our society. System change is coming, it is, but whether it will be fascistic collapse or a socialist revolution, 
really depends on us, us being the working class. And this involves having hard conversations with loved ones and acting with compassion, asking questions and offering guidance. Contact a union rep, discuss with your coworkers, boycott toxic industries and rally in the streets, run for office and always, always, always cast a vote. We are in the final good years here. I wholeheartedly believe this and we have never been better situated and may never be better situated to alter the collision course that we are on. It is too late to prevent climate change, but we may still mitigate it, rise to meet its challenges and install a social system that may cushion the blow for those who would otherwise be hit hardest. Our fight is an existential one. It's against climate change, it's against capitalism, against fear and its inevitable spawn, but together, we can rise to meet it. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Our next speaker is Victor Morgan. He is the lead organizer of Socialist Action Atlantic Branch, an occasional writer, lifelong socialist, and member of the LGBTQ community. Victor studies environmental science and has spent almost his entire life in Newfoundland and Labrador, better known across Canada as the Rock. Victor. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm very happy to be here this evening. This is climate science and climate change is one of my passions. And it's unfortunately something that I'm confronted with basically every year here in Newfoundland. Our climate has changed drastically within the last decade. I can remember as a kid having to climb over snowbanks to go get candy for Halloween. And now we're lucky if we have snow come Christmas time. We're lucky if we see snow until January or February, which is a, a massive change within the span of a decade. It's a ridiculously quick change. And we know that this is caused by humans. It's, it's settled science at this point. You see on, online and you see talking points all the time about uh, politicians saying, well, we don't know. It's not settled science. There's, the, the, jury, the jury is still out. The jury is not still out. The jury is in. The jury has cast their verdict. They have gone home. They're now in bed. It's, it's done, settled, and clear that we are causing this climate change. Is climate change natural for the planet? Yes. However, it takes place over the span of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, and it is pushed by um, average natural phenomenon, volcanoes, meteoric impacts, um, polar ice caps moving or melting, tectonic plate shift. It is caused naturally in the world. But again, these changes take place over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So you have an environment in which the natural world can evolve and it can acclimate to meet those changes naturally over the course of millennia, over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. What we're doing right now is we are hyper speeding this effect. We are pushing climate change to the absolute breaking point that the earth is, is not used to dealing with. And every time it has dealt with this, this speed of climate change in the past, due to again, um, volcanic eruption or, um, uh, massive ice ages caused by such things, it creates massive die-offs on the planet. Huge swaths of species are wiped out. Um, uh, an example of that that we have now is in the Northwest Territories, they do a muskox culling every season, and they were not able to do that for the past uh, season, and I believe the season before that, because a gut worm has worked its way north because the temperature has, ri has risen to such that they can survive in that climate now. So this parasite has made its way north, and it is now infecting their population. So the population is so low that they cannot do their cull, they cannot harvest the, the food that they require, the meat that they require, because the population's just not there. And there, there are thousands of examples of this all across the world. So why is it the way it is now? Why is climate change being pushed so quickly forward? Uh, and as um, the two speakers before me mentioned, capitalism is is forcing this. It's not just affecting it. Capitalism isn't affecting climate change. It caused this climate change. This climate change we're currently going through now, this arc of climate change, was caused by capitalism. The Industrial Revolution, the, the revolution of farming um, to be a massive uh, producer rather than uh, uh, farming vegetables and crops, we now farm cattle at a massive rate compared to what we did before. And people seem to not accept the fact that that is a massive influencer of our climate change is also farming. It's not just the oil and gas industry, while that is a massive part of it, it's also our agriculture. It's also the amount that we, we pollute. It's the amount that we consume things we don't need. 
So capitalism uh, affects, drives, pushes, and capitalism is climate change in essence. If we were to do away with capitalism tomorrow and produce what we needed, produce what was, we, we can still live very comfortable lives. Like the, uh, the idea is not that, that humanity goes back to living in huts and hovels in, in uh, the jungle like we did you know, 40,000 years ago. We can keep our lives fairly similar to what we, they are now. We just have to produce in ways that are smart. We have to deal with our natural resources in ways that are smart, ways that do not harm our mother earth. We need to stop producing products that have a shelf life of a year and then you go get a new one. What's the next new iPhone? What's the next new car I want? What's the next new computer part that I need? It, we live in a society of consume and throw away, consume and throw away, consume and throw away. And it's the same thing with the way we eat. Uh, how, how many times have we seen stories about countries cracking down on uh, grocery store throwaways, things that they could have kept or they could have given away or they could have used for something else, massive amounts of food, thousands of tons of food are just thrown away. There, there exists no scarcity of food in the current world that we have created. It exists. It's there. We, are, we just aren't giving it to the people who need it because we're letting it sit on store shelves, trying to sell it for a ridiculous markup. And when it doesn't sell for that ridiculous markup, we throw it out. So it, it's it affects everything. Capitalism has wormed its way into every single part of our lives and it has damaged every single part of our lives. And if we're going to fight climate change, capitalism has to go. It has to change. We have to reformulate the way we as humans interact with our important industries. We have to alter the way we interact with our important resources. We cannot continue this cycle of endless use and discarding. Um, and a massive portion of that uh, use and discarding, um, which most you know people don't know because it happened so long ago, is use is due to capitalist mafias that were set up to control the quality of the products that we consume. Uh, Henry Ford is famous for once saying, "You can have a Ford in any color you want as long as that color's black." Until the board got together and the argument was made, well, if we make one in blue maybe people will buy the black one and the blue one. And if we make one in red the year after, maybe they'll want that version. And now we see the vehicle industry as it's much the same as the, as the smartphone industry. Every year there's a new model with very few, if not zero changes. Every year there's, there's a, a new version of a vehicle that just has a new skeleton, a new skeleton or a new, uh, a new body around it that are not functionally different than the ones that came out the year before, but they're still being sold for forty-eight or, or sixty thousand dollars. So uh, we also had the light bulb mafia that was set up, uh, you know, decades ago because light bulbs started lasting too long. People started buying less light bulbs because they didn't need to. They had them in their homes and they were functional for decades. They, they could run for 10 years or 15 years. So all the companies got together and they decided we can't keep this up. People are not buying light bulbs at the rate they were before. So the four or five or three or four massive main manufacturers of, of light bulbs got together and decided we're going to create regulations within ourselves that keep the lifespan of these products low so people keep buying them. So a light bulb will only last a year or two years and then people had to buy more. So that was a decision by these industries to make a lesser product, to pollute more, to keep the money flowing. So based on capitalism alone, we got a worse product, the environment was damaged, the industry itself was damaged, innovation was stamped out because it was not profitable. And that's a theme that I'm going to touch on a couple of times here. Innovation sometimes is not profitable. And that's why we don't get it. There's a thing called the Google graveyard, which is uh, thousands of products uh, that Google has purchased that they just killed outright because they in, they interfered with other industries that Google has money in, or they interfered with other industries that, that Google produces products for that would have either upset these industries or, or innovated the industry in a way that would have made it either cheaper or better for the consumer. And they didn't want that. So they bought the product, they killed the product. So what we see is capitalists have completely taken over our governments. Um, like uh, Sister Yvonne mentioned earlier, they own our politicians. That's why there's so much mistrust is because you aren't dealing with a politician that serves you and respects you and wants to do what your wishes are. They're doing what you know, Jeff Bezos wants done. They're doing what BP Oil wants done because they don't care about their constituents because their constituents can't give them $100,000 uh, from their own personal pocket to run their campaign. 
And as we've seen recently, campaigns are very much revolving around money. I mean, we saw a Democratic candidate in the U.S. able to buy a massive portion of the primary election because he was a billionaire. So he put up his signs and he ran his ads and he managed to get a, a large portion of the vote, even though he was not politically known beforehand just because of his money. So money makes politics move. And unfortunately, that has led to a refusal to accept that the endless burning of fossil fuels is causing our climate change and, and the refusal to change it. Here in Newfoundland, we have a commitment by our liberal government, our climate change believing government to double our oil production by 2030, to double it, not increase it slightly, completely double it. And half of our oil production is heavy crude, an extremely dirty product that we're going to funnel out of our, our oceans into barrels to be burned in vehicles. And it's ridiculous that they have that commitment. They put over $280 million towards uh, oil and gas infrastructure in 2021. Green energy got less than, I think it was 5 million in an investment. And it's only for to help people buy green cars and to help people convert their homes away from uh, oil and gas heating to an electric uh, mode of heating, uh, which isn't helpful because in the winters in Newfoundland, we have rolling blackouts to keep our grid up. So if you're going to switch dozens or hundreds of houses to electric heat, we don't have the infrastructure to accommodate that. So it's great on paper to switch these people to green energy, but we don't have a way to produce energy to accommodate the, the extra draw on the system. Um, we, we also have in the province, this, this year uh, just now and the year before, we have an increase in, in forest fires because of obviously climate change is increasing the heat and the energy in our atmosphere. And we are getting extremely dry summers, which leads to a lessened cloud cover, which leads to drier, hotter environment, more fire. And we don't have the infrastructure to fight it. Newfoundland is extremely uh, out of date when it comes to its fire protection services. We're driving around in, in the rural areas in vehicles that can be 30 or 40 years old. Um, my hometown still has a fire truck with, with, with the cabin made of wood. It's not something that we can just, you know, snap our fingers and get up to date uh, 2022 fire trucks everywhere in the province. It's not possible. So we have a situation where many communities don't have the equipment to fight it. Many communities don't have a way out if the fire comes. Uh, a lot of the communities only have one main road. So if the main road is blocked off, you can't go anywhere. So fire here is extremely dangerous. It, it's, it's not like the larger provinces where there are so many different ways to leave so many different places. If there are, are one or two roads cut off here, you can't go anywhere. You're stuck where you are. So it's extremely unsafe. And this is not just, the out-of-date equipment is not just the story of Newfoundland, it's, it's all over the province or, and, or all over the country where money is not being put into the specific services that it should be put into. Sometimes we get a little bit here and there, but I mean, our water bombers are all out of date. Our fire trucks are almost all out of date. Our water infrastructure itself, our water lines are almost all out of date. So even if we do get a fire, who's to say that there's gonna be water in the lines to fight it? Uh, several communities uh, in the past in Newfoundland have had droughts because their water lines have dried up and it's getting worse now. Um, we're having water boil orders all the time. We're running out of water all the time. So it's, it's, a, it's a cyclical system of it just keeps getting worse because it just keeps getting worse. So now it's almost like a self-fueling disaster. Um, and unfortunately, we're, we're seeing that come to a head in the Atlantic because the storms are more frequent now. They're more powerful now. We just saw a massive storm hit Puerto Rico as a Category 1 hurricane. And within 24 hours, it was up to a Category 3. That level of Category 1 to 3 increase that quickly is almost unheard of. And now it has been increased within the last few hours to a Category 4. And the Atlantic Canada has never seen a Category 4. We've never dealt with a storm of that power, of that magnitude. And if it doesn't weaken before it hits the coastline, there will be untold devastation and damage. And it's, it's a problem that has become more frequent. Right now, there is uh, Hurricane Fiona that is going to hit Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, PEI and New Brunswick within uh, two days. Other than that, there is one far off to the east of it, um, 
Hurricane Gustav, I believe they've called it, that is forming now. And there are two more storm cells to the south of that um, going in the direction of Puerto Rico that will likely reach hurricane status. So there exists a very real possibility of having four functional measurable hurricanes at one time in the Atlantic Ocean, which is it's incredibly dangerous and, and almost unheard of at this point. We've never seen storms to that magnitude here. The last hurricane we had that hit the island was Hurricane Igor, and that was a category one, which caused massive amount of damage and killed four people. Just as a comparison, a category four, when it hit Puerto Rico a few years ago, killed 3,000 people. They, and they're still rebuilding now. A lot of uh, Puerto Rico's infrastructure was temporary when that category one hit a few days ago. So they were already dealing with bridges that weren't meant to last, roads that weren't meant to last, schools that weren't meant to last because they were supposed to be rebuilt later on and they never were. So they had temporary infrastructure that just was not capable of, of holding back that level of storm. And with climate change, you have a massive dump of energy into the atmosphere that is causing this, this extremely energetic storm system to keep going. Um, and, and as stated earlier, it's cyclical. These areas, if the storms continue at this frequency, at this magnitude, these areas will be uninhabitable because it just won't make sense to build homes there anymore. If you're going to build a home there and two years later, a hurricane's going to break it down, you're going to build another one and a year later, a hurricane's going to break it down. People are just going to have to stop living there. And you're going to find that with a lot of the less industrialized, less modernized areas in the world. They don't have the ways to survive this that we do. And, and even in Newfoundland, our infrastructure is horrible. Our, if you were to come and grade our infrastructure, we wouldn't get an A, B, C, or D. The, the grader would probably put us in detention. It, it, it's not something that we pride ourselves in here. I mean, the roads are, are atrocious. The bridges are falling apart. So if we do get a hard hurricane that hits us, it is going to cause a lot of damage that is that is going to take weeks or months to fix. When Hurricane Igor hit, my hometown was cut off from the rest of the island for almost two weeks. Both sides of the roads were washed out. You couldn't get across. So if anyone had an, uh, an emergency or an accident, they would have had to be airlifted out. So this is causing a lot of problems for a lot of the the I don't want to say poorer areas in the world, but that's often how they are described, but that's not where it's going to stop. This is not something that's not going to touch the whiter parts of the world. This is going to hit everyone and it's going to affect everyone. We saw in BC, you know, between four and 700 people the last two years die of heat stroke when they were walking home or walking to work. So it's, it's something we're going to see a lot more of. And it's something that as sister Yvonne mentioned, we can't stop climate change as it is now. We can try our best to mitigate the worst parts, but we have to actually try. Our governments have to actually do something rather than talk about it, rather than go to summits on their private jets and, and talk up how good their country's doing because they put $2 million towards green energy infrastructure. There's almost no innovation now, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, solar panels are behind, windmills are behind, geothermal energy is behind because money's not being put toward it like it is with the oil and gas industry. So our green energies right now are behind by decades. I mean, there's the entire documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? It was the fossil fuel industry because they knew it would damage their bottom line, it would damage their product. So they stifled innovation for decades to make sure that it didn't touch their bottom line. So capitalism and climate change go hand in hand. The two are entwined. If we are going to fight back against climate change, we have to fight back against capitalism because under capitalism, a forest has no value unless it is a parking lot. A whale has no value unless it is butchered. The ocean has no value unless it can be trawled. So capitalism and, and the environment are not compatible. Capitalism and climate change are completely entwined. So if we're going to fight one, we have to fight the other, because if capitalism remains, then climate change will get worse. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, thanks to Jeff, Yvonne, and Victor for your wonderful presentations. Now we are going to turn it over to our technical producer, uh, and he's going to put forward uh, forth the first uh, three questions. They're in the chat, but also he will read them. So um, go ahead. Yeah. So the first question is, given the findings of Planet of the Humans, given that the way we consume our meat, endless militarism, and ongoing car use, have we passed the tipping point? 
Should we still fight for a Green New Deal in the hopes it gives the Earth's lung slash lifespan a few more years or decades? Question two is, why is carbon capture not a solution? Question three is, will COP27 likely produce mostly what Greta Thunberg calls blah, blah, blah? Okay, so you've heard the three questions. You can answer one, two, or three. We're going to start with Yvonne and then go to Victor and then go to Jeff and you have up to five minutes. Okay. Yeah, so I think, oh hi, yeah, sorry. Um, so I think I covered the first question maybe a little bit in, in my, what I said, but um, we are at a tipping point. We've completely reached the tipping point. Like I, I sincerely don't think that there's like, a, I don't think that there's anything we can do to, prevent the disastrous effects that will be brought on by climate change like absolutely not but i do think that there's things that we can do to install a system that's going to cushion the blow and also to install a system that will work to kind of repair some of that damage over the next hundreds and hundreds of years like i don't think that we are currently on a, a path that's going to render the earth completely like just a barren mars like rock in 200 years we easily could be on that path uh, if we keep going this way for 50 years, we've got a chance to stop that and to maintain habitability on our planet. But I don't think that we have an opportunity to maintain the shape of our planet as we know it, specific, particularly our social system. Like the, the global south is going to become increasingly unlivable. We just, we know that to be true. I don't think that there's anything we can do to prevent that. We can, we can install social infrastructure that will make it a lot more friendly and hospitable to the climate refugees that will inevitably have to come to Canada, even just from the United States, which we've seen get completely ravaged by climate change in the last few years. So there's that. Um, the second question, which is you know, why is carbon capture not um, not viable. And actually, John Oliver did a, an excellent um, piece on this recently on, on carbon offsets. And he points out that there's, there's just not enough space on planet Earth to plant enough trees to absorb all the excess carbon dioxide that we're emitting. Like, it, it's literally not a solution. It's not just that it's like not feasible. It's like it's, it's, there's literally not enough room for it. And, and having these carbon capture facilities and stuff, it's, it's really just like putting a little space spray bottle on a forest fire. Sure, you're doing something, but you're not doing what needs to be done. And it's a big waste of money, a great way for companies to kind of pour money into this and say, look, we're carbon neutral. We have all these carbon offsets. Sets. We've been funding carbon capture, blah, blah, blah. And, and kind of wipe their hands of all of the emissions that they're actually putting into the environment. So it's also completely not scalable. Um, and it also doesn't deal with any of the other anthropogenic toxins that we're emitting into the environment, like microplastics and the destruction of the oceans. Like those things, are somewhat related to climate change, but they're also somewhat not. And even if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, we would still need to deal with a lot of the other harmful effects of capitalism and unmitigated growth. Okay, Victor? Yeah, so I, I think Yvonne did an absolutely amazing job at, at breaking that down. Um, just to, just to kind of put a, an additional point out there um, specifically about fighting for a green new deal we as a population need to realize that a green new deal is not a light switch it will take decades to implement the things that need to be done we need to retrofit every gas station across the face of the planet to accommodate electric vehicles we need to increase public transit in a massive way in a, in a much more uh, extensive way than we have been we need in energy infrastructure to indeed support that infrastructure of green vehicles and green housing so fighting for a green new deal most people think oh once a green new deal is agreed upon uh everything will be fixed and the world will be changed that is not the case it is going to take decades to fix this so we should be fighting a lot harder than we are to get our politicians to actually support a green new deal because it's going to take years if not decades to actually implement said green new deal once it is agreed upon so it's it's not something that's going to be done quickly it will take years to retrofit to rebuild to alter all of our infrastructure to accommodate what is a green new deal. So it, we shouldn't we shouldn't even entertain the politicians that say carbon neutral by 2050. We don't have 30 years to do this. We do not have three decades of waiting around with, with our thumbs in our unmentionable places trying to fix a problem that we already know how to fix. We're just waiting for the politicians to stop taking the money from BP Energy uh, so they can actually agree to them. And uh, to touch on a point mentioned earlier as well, some companies are doing carbon offset things 
uh, like BP Energy. BP Energy changed the name from BP Oil to BP Energy because they want to produce less oil to be a greener company. What they don't tell you is they plan to produce 300% the amount of plastics that they currently produce to offset the amount of oil that they're selling. They will sell it to other companies to produce plastic products rather than to uh, gas stations or, um, or burnable products, sh should we say. So they don't plan on actually helping the world or saving the environment. They want to save their bottom line, but also look flowery and pretty while they do it. Um, and yeah, uh, question two, why is carbon capture not a solution? Again, we just, we just don't have the space for it and we don't have the time to build it. Projects like that, that would actually offset the carbon that would even make a difference are going to take decades to approve, clear the land, build the product. We need, we would need so much innovation in the, in the section of, of carbon capture. It would just take an unimaginable amount of time to have a technology capable of of capturing the amount of CO2 that we need it to. And it might not even be theoretically possible to do it. So to pursue carbon capture as some sort of band-aid that we can use to cover this absolute gaping bullet wound that is climate change, it just seems to me like a waste of time. We, we know that most countries as they sit now are no longer carbon neutral because of the forest fires that they've experienced, because of the clear cutting that they've experienced, um, because of the amount of, C of, of CO2 that they produce. So there are ways that we can solve it, but it's not something where we can just ignore the amount of carbon that we produce and hope that the solutions we come up with fix the problem. We need to massively cut down on the CO2 that we produce before we can start solving any of these issues. Uh, and question three, will, will COP27 likely produce uh, what Greta Thunberg calls blah, blah, blah? Yes, absolutely. And it will continue to do so as long as we send politicians there that are in the pockets of the oil companies, that are in the pockets of the oil industry. As long as they serve their masters, we are going to see blah, blah, blah until it kills us. And they aren't going to change unless they stop getting the money from massive oil conglomerates and they actually start to care. You might get it with younger politicians who, who actually have to live a life in this horrible burning world that we're going to create. But the 80 and 90 year old politicians, they're already on their way out. They don't care. So it, it's going to be blah, blah, blah from them. And they're just going to take their money and, and put it in their holdings. And they're, they're going to hope for the best for the last decade or two of their lives. So we're going to see blah, blah, blah until the private money comes out of it. You, Jeff? <coughs> Yeah, so so just quickly, I think I'll try and answer two, three, and then one. So on, on carbon capture, I'm no engineer, but um, my understanding is it's just technically uh, not feasible that most of their attempts to um, pr produce viable methods for carbon capture simply uh, don't work. But uh, aside from anything else, that once you capture the carbon, <laughs> it's carbon capture and storage. You have to store it forever. Because, you know, uh, the, 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 most of the plans are based on injecting it deep under the ground. And of course, if it leaks out, then you're back where you started. But more fundamentally, the problem with these kind of plans is that they are usually um, undertaken um, not to prevent environmental destruct environmentally destructive um, practices, but in order to facilitate them. So the point of you know um things like carbon capture from corporations perspectives is that they facilitate uh, an intensified round of capital accumulation that so rather than stopping the things that we know are destroying the planet they allow them to be done at a new level of intensity so you know um uh, Victor spoke about um, recycling and and and, and uh, the plastics industry on that basis. I mean, it's 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 incredibly clear when they when the plastic industry talks about plastics recycling, they do it as part of a plan to massively increase plastics production. So there's a fundamental capitalist logic behind that. In, in terms of number three and COP twenty seven, yeah, I mean the the, the COP twenty seven. The, the, the whole COP process has been catastrophic. I mean, you know, uh, there's a statistic that I come back to um, time and time again that that the vast majority of um, human produced carbon in the in the global atmosphere has been released since after the Kyoto talks, not before, after. So the entire time that we've been talking about, um, that our politicians have been talking about doing something about um, 
carbon emissions we've been the, the world has in fact increased more and more and you know like we know for instance that the world's biggest fossil fuel companies have uh, commitments worth i think 900 billion dollars of more fossil fuel projects by the year 2030 um, the first question i think though is the most um the most important and i, I think it's really clear and it's it's tremendously important. There is nothing progressive about doomerism, and 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 this is a real tendency on the left. I think there's this notion that it's all catastrophic. There's nothing that can be done. The world is falling apart. You know, it, it's often put forward as a kind of left wing, um, a left wing rhetoric, a way of sort of shocking people into taking action. It doesn't have that effect. Actually, if you tell people that everything is hopeless, then why should they do anything um, at 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 all and in fact the situation is not hopeless that um no matter how bad things are things can always get worse and at the same time human beings have a tremendous creative potential that merely needs to be um unleashed so the more we fight now the better things will be in the future the less we fight now the worse things will be um in 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 the future so in my presentation i stress the need to fundamentally change humanity's relationship with nature which means ending the capitalist system but that doesn't mean that there is nothing that can be done short of ending the capitalist system every victory against the fossil fuel companies means that the future will be better every defeat at the hands of the fossil fuel companies means the future will be worse and i think that's tremendously important actually what happens from here on in is up to us it's up to the kind of resistance that we're able to mount um and uh you know um we should not give ground to the notion there's nothing that could be done i suspect to be honest that this will be increasingly a talking point of the fossil fuel companies themselves which is to say, well, you know, that, that they will flip from saying climate change isn't happening to saying climate change is inevitable and therefore it's ridiculous to be trying to do, any, do something about it. And I think it's really important that we say that this is not the case at all, that another world is still possible. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to Dave, our technical producer, for the next three questions. So the first question is, electrifying every vehicle won't solve the climate crisis. What can we do about car culture? The second question is, is degrowth possible or desirable? What would a working class agenda look like? The third question is, why should the focus for change be on production rather than on consumer behavior? Okay, you've heard the three questions. You again have up to five minutes and we will start with Victor, then Jeff, and then Yvonne. Victor? Okay, so uh, I'm going to go question one first, I guess. Electrifying every vehicle won't solve the climate crisis. What can we do about car culture? So yeah, definitely electrifying every vehicle will not solve the climate crisis, mostly because creation of vehicles is actually a very uh, carbon heavy process. There are many plastics that go into creation of vehicles. There are many fumes and other things created in their construction. So having personalized uh, every single person on planet earth has a vehicle or three is definitely not something we want in our future. That's not something we, we will be able to keep doing forever and ever and ever and have it not be a problem. Um, we need to start recycling vehicles a lot more than we do rather than throwing them into dumps and whatnot, there, there has to be some sort of um, vehicle recycling process. I mean, the amount of metal that we just throw away every year is ridiculous when it comes to that industry. So something that can be done about it is a massive increase in public transit. Public transit is the lifeblood of the working class, and it is something we need vastly more of, whether that's uh, public rail, whether that's busing, whatever it looks like going forward in the future. We need something to change, and it, it's definitely got to be in a public transit way. Having a personalized vehicle is not something that is going to help climate change. So yeah, definitely having every vehicle just switch to electric energy is not uh, going to be a, an end all fix all for that. Um, second question. Is, oh, and, and sorry, what do we do about car culture? Uh, there is nothing we can do until the car industry itself changes because the automotive industry created car culture. They are pushing car culture forward with their billions in do of dollars in, um, in, 
uh, billboards and magazines and TV shows. So like you're, you're going to be able to fight back against that a little bit, but until it becomes like taboo to kind of push that, I think you're still going to have the issue of the car industry, just forcing the narrative that car culture is a cool thing for everybody to be into. Um, second question is degrowth possible or desirable. What would a working class agenda look like? So I think degrowth is, is in some ways possible. Obviously you're still going to need, um, you know, enough land for people to live on. You're still going to need what is essentially cities, though that may look different in the future. Um, but I think the thing we need to focus on most about degrowth is to look at who is abusing the space, who is abusing land ownership, who is abusing um, the, the, you know, the functions of our life, who is consuming just massive amounts of food. I mean, we look at super yachts all the time as, as much as I hate that term, but they're almost constantly stocked with food, like just in case their owner visits. And that food is usually thrown out every couple of days or, or every week. So they go through a massive amount of waste and a massive amount of usage or of usage. So I think if we, if we cut down the people who are using far too much land for nothing. I mean, billionaires have houses with multiple hectares of property around them that they'll never go into. Um, and we focus more on what we need to live and making sure everybody gets that rather than making sure the top 1% can get absolutely everything they could have ever possibly wanted. Um, I think degrowth will be a lot more feasible and a lot more possible. Uh, if we don't come at it from a way of we need to change every part of human existence or we're all going to die, I think there's a lot of things that can be done on the front of, of degrowth that would not only be possible, but also desirable. So I think it's something that is definitely um, kind of like a bright light in the future, because I think it can work in, in a lot of ways that benefit us. Uh, and what would a working class agenda look like? We as a population are eventually going to get to the point where we can and probably will automate everything. There's going to be a lot of industries that won't exist anymore because they just can't exist in, in the future. Like most fast food industries won't be there anymore because they consume a massive amount of product for a very little amount of turnout. Um, so they're very wasteful industries. So they likely won't exist in 20 or 30 years, at least not like they do now. Um, so a working class agenda will probably look a lot thinner than it does now. There will probably be a lot of jobs that humans don't have to do anymore, and most of them will be automated, um, which is, you know, it's problematic in some ways and it's beneficial in some ways, as long as we focus on it being a good thing. Like, unless we just make everybody unemployed, give everybody no money, and now we give all the jobs to the robots, that's going to be a hellscape of a working class environment. If, if we look at it as, okay, now that we're automating things, humanity can now take some of the weight off of its workload, and we can now live our lives doing the things that we want to do, and we have funds provided to be able to do that. I know I'm kind of talking about a, a socialist utopia, but like, isn't that the dream for everybody to, to live the life that they want to live without having to go to a nine to five every day until they're 65 and then they can waste away uh, in peace. And um, why should we focus? Uh, why should the focus be on the change of production rather than consumer, consumer behavior? I think it should kind of be focused on both, definitely production more so. But I think as people, we need to kind of move away from needing to have the new iPhone, needing to have the new car, needing to have the new house. Like there's a lot of things we just don't need as people that were fed the lie that we do need by these massive corporations. Thank you. Uh, me? Yeah. Um, well, Yvonne. maybe I'll start. Oh, sorry, Yvonne. Oh, no, sorry. I thought Jeff was going. I'm going last. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You're correct, Jeff. Go ahead. Cool. All right. I might start with the um, third question because I think in many ways it, it helps answer uh, the, 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 the first two. The, the reason why the focus should be... Uh, on production rather than consumer behavior is we don't actually have very much control over consumer behavior. So if we talk about car culture, for instance, the main reason uh, that the, the corporations were able to construct car culture in the first place, and I write about this at length in, um, in, in my book, is that, um, well, partly that they ran a PR campaign around it, but more, much more effectively is that they redesigned um, 
Western cities to make cars essentially um, necessities for working class people. It's not a question about whether you want to have a car in most places, particularly in, like certainly in Australia, it's very, very difficult to live a normal life without a car because of the way that your workplace, where you work and where you live and where you socialize are so separated from each other that there's no way, you know, so, so, so the, the alternative to car culture becomes a kind of luxury that's far more accessible to people with money who can afford, you know, um, other alternatives than it is to ordinary working class people who need a car to pick up the kids from school. It's no point berating them for living a way that they don't have any choice but live that 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 way, and that's why. Um, well, well, and that helps us, I think, answer the second question about degrowth. It seems to me the issue I always have with this um, formulation around degrowth. I think in some respects it's almost like a category error because it, it presents the socialist future in terms that are inherited from capitalist economics, which simply measure the well-being of an economy in a numerical scale, right? Whether it's growing or whether it's shrinking, actually what matters to human needs, what, what matters to humanity is whether particular needs um, are met or whether they're not. And so when we're talking about socialism, we are talking about production for use uh, rather than exchange. And that's not something that's measured numerical, numerically. So some, as Victor said, some in some um, in some, some areas, production will, we will want production to increase greatly in things like public transport and things like the kind of the use of technology to sort of heal the land and to fix the environment. We will want far more resources. Other industries, we will want to disappear entirely. I can't imagine that we would want a society with a huge military expenditure or a huge expenditure or advertising. So simply posing the question, posing the question in terms of growth or, um, or, or not um, misses the point, it, it, it seems to me. Really what we need to be talking about is a situation where human beings collectively and democratically control our labour because our labour is the way that we interact with the natural world. And if we were able to democratically control how we interacted with the natural world, well, we would be in a situation where we'd be able to, to, to live in a society that did, did not destroy nature, but in fact fostered it and, and um, strengthened it, increased biodiversity rather than um, limiting it. And yeah, I, I think I'll leave that there. Thank you. Yvonne? <laughs> Hi, yeah. So that's a really interesting point about growth. Um, I was taking growth like fairly literally so not just economic growth but also just the physical growth of human activity and our cities and our impact on the world around us um, and I consider growth and car culture actually to be very linked and degrowth and walking away from car culture to also be very linked so I'm going to answer these questions together um, but basically like you look at photos of cities like Los Angeles before cars rose to dominate and conquer our planet. <laughs> and it, it's actually a very livable place. You know, there's people in the streets, there's a mixture between trams and carriages and things that are located in close proximity to each other that enable the transportation of goods and people. And it just, it makes sense. Um, you see these sort of thriving areas <laughs> that are full of human activity where things get done, but they get done more slowly than they get done today. And they get done in greater proximity to each other. And you look at LA now and other North American cities, and it's like a concrete hellscape, right? Nobody wants to go outside and walk. And, and many North American cities are like this, almost all, maybe all. Uh, so much energy goes into maintaining our roadways and other car infrastructure. And so much energy is just completely wasted uh, transporting goods because we have allowed roads and car infrastructure to create such massive gulfs between our institutions and our people. And looking at a top-down map of sprawling Canadian cities, you can be completely awed by the sheer volume of space that is taken up by parking lots. And all of that space represents additional energy that is required to transport things and people from point A to point B. So we built everything in the name of, of speed under the assumption that energy is infinite. And it turns out that that actually makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and we should have made those building things with a greater concern for or a greater consideration of the fact that we need to prioritize um, um, not consuming as much energy. 
So once we eliminate cars or at least significantly reduce our reliance on them, degrowth becomes possible and necessary. <laughs> And I sincerely think that this is like an excellent step one for restructuring our cities and our economy to be more energy efficient and more human friendly and especially more sustainable. So the world that we know is moving too fast. And I feel like everybody kind of feels that like, oh, my God, things are going so fast. And it's because we've built our society on prioritizing speed and degrowth and abandoning car culture will both require slowing down. And that is, that is okay. <laughs> like, I would not mind. And then the second question um, was just consumer versus producer behavior. I mean, I think we all have a fairly good grasp of why, but producers determine what is available <laughs> to be consumed. And for example, like I have a box of raspberries in my fridge that's in a plastic container. And I totally would have bought a box of, of raspberries if it was in a cardboard box, but there was no raspberries available in a cardboard box. And that's because it is more profitable to produce raspberries in a plastic container for the producers, right? And my options are to then buy something in plastic or go without it. And you could easily say, oh, we'll go without raspberries for sure. But it's every food item in the grocery store and I can't go without food, right? You can buy things in bulk, uh, but even the bulk bins <laughs> that you buy from come in plastic in just larger plastic containers. So that's not a great solution. Trying to live a waste-free life um, where in a world where producers determine how much waste you produce is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's often like impossible. Not, yeah. And there's also a lot of waste that's hidden from consumers. So for example, I used to work at a garden store and we would get these boxes of trowels. And when you see a trowel hanging on the, on the hook, on the store, it looks like it's just a trowel and a little paper tag that's attached to the trowel, but actually they come individually wrapped in plastic and 10 individually wrapped plastic trowels are then in a larger plastic bag and those are in boxes and the boxes are then wrapped the skin on tons of plastic. <laughs> so how can you put that on the consumer? The consumer doesn't even see it. The consumer has no idea that that's even happening. It is obviously, obviously a problem on the producer's end. So I think making producers more accountable for the amount of garbage that their products produce would be an excellent first step. But I think there's a lot more legislation that needs to go into preventing this complete absurd scale of plastic waste. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to Dave for our, our final two questions. Dave? So the first question is, what is the connection between the needed change of leadership in the working class organizations like unions and the NDP and the replacement of the capitalist system as a whole? And the second question is, what gives you hope? Okay, so we're going to give you four minutes each to answer, and we will start with Jeff, then Yvonne, and then Victor. Okay, so what gives me hope? Well, two things. Firstly, a historical understanding that we haven't always lived like this, that in fact capitalism is a system that's only been around for um, a few hundred years, and prior to capitalism there were different ways of living, and that meant different ways of relating to the natural world ways that weren't as destructive. And as soon as you start to think about that, well, if we didn't live like that in the past, we needn't live like that in the future. So that's the first thing that gives me hope. The second thing that gives me hope is the, the continuation of various kinds of resistance, even when we um, least expect it. You know, there's a constant sort of sense that um, there's a constant argument that you hear that people today are apathetic, they won't take a stand around anything. Well, at the same time, you know, like um, if we look back over the, the past few years, we can look at things like the Black Lives Matter movement around the world, which according to some commentators was the biggest ever, so, um, the biggest ever social movement in terms of people participating in demonstrations ever in human history. That is not nothing. You know, there might be all sorts of problems with that movement, but uh, nonetheless, the fact that people are prepared to fight back in such huge quantities is tremendously uh, inspiring. Um, in terms of the first question, I don't really know what the NDP is, so I'm not necessarily sure that I can answer that. But um, in terms of the general point um, about leadership, I think that the changes that we need will come from the bottom and not not top and um the social struggles that we need social struggles that will have to be on the scale of the social movements of the 60s and 
the 70s depend a great deal on new forms of organization and the, the construction of those new forms of organization will depend a great deal on leadership. And so, you know, um, which is why having these kind of meetings is important. We need to clarify, clarify our ideas. We need to have, uh, you know, um, activists who um, are committed to fundamental social change and won't get distracted by, you know, the various dead, eye, de um, dead end um, solutions that are put forward constantly, you know, that, that won't accept ideas that we should simply, you know, recycle our trash and that is going to be enough somehow to, 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 to save us. So um, I, I, th I think forging a new generation of leaders is tremendously um, important in the struggles that we're going to face. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, yeah, so for the first question, um, what's the connection between the change of leadership and the capitalist system as a whole? I mean, I already kind of touched on this. Leadership in working class organizations is based within a capitalist system. And I don't really think that that kind of change within a capitalist system is possible. I used to think that it was doable um, back when politics operated it's something of a black box to me, but since getting my degree in public science and running for office and becoming involved in numerous electoral campaigns, I have learned the inner workings or at least gotten a, a cursory view of the inner workings of that black box. And I have come to understand that change is not actually possible within the system. I sincerely believe that. So I, I do straight up believe that there needs to be a really revolution. Um, system change is coming. <laughs> like, uh, climate change is coming. These massive changes are coming. They're going to happen. Uh, but it's really up to the working class and our level of class consciousness to determine how that change is going to land. And the second question, what gives you hope? Oh my God, I really struggled um, to answer this, but I don't have a, a written response. But I, uh, I think tracking the history of humanity and looking back um, at how things have always landed, humanity has always survived. And there's always been some contingent that has persevered. Um, it's not always the good guys, but good guys will come again, right? Human institutions have bloomed and faded fascism and, and regimes a la the Roman Empire have risen and fallen throughout history. And there has always been a light at the end of the tunnel, regardless of how dim that light may appear at any given point. So even though it looks like we're headed for some pretty dark times ahead, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dark times will go on forever into obscurity and completely land humanity at, at the, the complete bottom of the barrel. I think there will always be that light and it's up to us to, to look for it and to keep working towards it no matter how distant it may seem. Okay, thank you. Victor? So I'm going to go with question one, then question two. Um, what is the connection between the needed change of the leadership in the working class organizations like the unions and the NDP and their replacement of the capitalist system as a whole? Um, so just, um, you know, uh, Jeff mentioned a really good point. Some people watching this might not know what the NDP is. Um, that's the new Democratic Party here in Canada. That's our most left uh, party as opposed to the Liberals or the Conservatives, uh, though some would argue that the NDP and the Liberals have a, a great deal of crossover now, unfortunately. But that is uh, an incredibly connected topic because, uh, as Yvonne mentioned, the system doesn't work on its own in a corner, not interacting with everything else. So once a union gets big enough, or if a union is even allowed to be created in the first place, uh, the capitalist owners will target that union. They will target the leadership. They will target them for, for replacement. They will put in their own people, their own leaders, their own politicians, their own speakers that will further the goal of their capitalist overlords, that will further the goal of their masters. And they don't care about the union. They might be there in a, in a position of union leadership, but they're not there to serve the union. They're not there to serve the working class. They're there to serve the capitalist class and to work with them to maybe either um, keep the union's requests low or uh, deny them entirely, as we've seen with certain unions when the union itself wants to strike, the leadership doesn't. So it's an incredibly connected system, unfortunately. Uh, and in the NDP, uh, we have politicians all over Canada who are capitalists, who care about the capitalist system. Um, we don't have any, as far as I'm aware, actual mainline politicians that are the leaders of any province or the leaders of any provincial party, maybe except now in New Brunswick, that identify as uh, 
a socialist or socialist adjacent person because everyone is too afraid to say the word because of the propaganda that's been gone around for the last hundred years um, to make you think that socialists are horrible people and capitalism is the only way we can fix any of our problems. So I think the systems are incredibly connected and, and it's definitely part of it. You need to replace the leadership in our political parties and our unions with people who are not sympathetic with the capitalists, people who are not sympathetic of uh, their regimes and their systems. But that, as Ivan said, that's not easy and it might not even be possible in systems that they have created because they have near infinite wealth and fighting back against that is not a small task in any way. Uh, and the second question, what gives you hope? Every topic we've covered so far every issue we've touched on except for the issue of you know present and prominent climate change is something that can be fixed we can innovate build fight back we can change the world all we have to do is choose to we have to choose to fight and stand up and demand that our world be protected by our leadership we can make uh, uh, more energy efficient grids. We can reorder our city. While these are large tasks, none of them are impossible. We can do all of them. So we can save ourselves a great deal of pain and a great deal of horror and a great deal of life loss if, if our governments get up off their asses and actually start doing it rather than just talking about it. The, the more blah, blah, blah is something that's not gonna fix anything. We need them to actually act. And it can be done it, it, to to be doomerist and to think that the world is ending is what these corporations want, because in that state, you will not fight back. You will think it's too late already. What's the point? And that's what they want, because if you won't fight back, nothing will change. But it can and it will. Things are going to change whether we want them to or not. But we can we can push the change in a direction that is desirable and better for us. We just have to know that it is possible because it is, and we have to be willing to do the work to get it there and willing to fight. It's all doable. It's all possible. And while we can't mitigate the climate change that has already happened, and we can't mitigate what's going to happen in the next few years, we can stop the absolute worst effects of it. And doing that is going to eventually create a world where we're back to an equilibrium where we're not dealing with the climate change that we have now. It's going to take, you know, decades to do it, but eventually we can be there. So what gives me hope is the possibility, it's the will, the human ingenuity, the human will to fight, the human resistance to being squashed out and crushed. We've seen it, as, as Jeff and Ivan said, throughout history, once stuff gets bad enough, we stop putting up with it. We break down the Berlin Wall, we riot at Stonewall, we will do everything we can to make it better once it gets bad enough. So I think you're going to see within the next few years there's going to be a massive amount of unrest and a massive amount of changes being made because people will have had enough. And once that happens, humans tend to change the world. So that gives me a massive amount of hope. Thank you. Okay, so this is bringing us now to the close of our program. So if you agree with what you've heard during this program, please join Socialist Action. Just sign up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, or you can call us at 647-986-1917. Easy to remember, 1917 was the year of the Russian Revolution. So I want to, to give a special thanks to our speakers, our panelists tonight, Jeff Sparrow, Yvonne Anson, and Victor Morgan, and also to our technical producer, David Henning in Toronto, and to Barry Wiseletter, the political producer of this web class. Please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action Newspaper, which we will send to you online, and in the future, it will be uh, mailed to you uh, in hard copy. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com. This show has been recorded and can be seen on the Socialist Action YouTube channel. And in saying that, we want to apologize to our uh, listeners who were waiting online for live streaming tonight. Sorry, folks, there was a glitch in the system. But glad you are listening now to the recording, and we promise we will do our very best to correct this before our next webcast. And our next webcast will be on Thursday, October the 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Socialists in the October Municipal Elections with Danny Drew, 
candidate for mayor in Guelph, Ontario, Sandra Griffith Bonaparte, running for school board in Ottawa, Ontario, and Daniel Charade, candidate for school board in Toronto. That's on Thursday, October the 6th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and the Zoom link is on the essay website. So on behalf of Barry and Dave and myself, Elizabeth, who is your host, please be safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Bye.